This is the third video in a series of videos about Gibbs free energy. We just finished talking about the sign of delta G and what that means about spontaneous reactions. And now we're going to talk about standard delta G and how we can solve for it. So this is going to sound a bit like a broken record here. But there is a standard set of conditions at which we measure Gibbs free energy. And it is the same set of standard conditions that we used for enthalpy and entropy. That's why it's called standard. And again, asterisk, we choose these standard conditions so that we can make reference tables of these numbers. So we can look them up so we don't have to measure all of them all of the time. OK, so the standard Gibbs free energy is the energy at one atmosphere, or more technically at one bar, and 25 degrees Celsius, unless specified. OK, and if we want to look at the Gibbs free energy of formation, we know that we need to do we need to consider one mole of product formed from elements in their standard states. Standard state elements. OK, so all of that should look familiar. And now if we want to solve for the standard delta G, there are three ways we can do so, several of which we have seen before. So first of all, just like enthalpy and just like entropy, Gibbs free energy is a state function, which I hope you realize by now is a really important property of these functions. And that property means we can take the difference in Gibbs free energy as the final minus the initial. And it doesn't matter how we got there, as long as the initial and final states are the same, this relationship holds true. So we can solve for the standard change in Gibbs free energy of a reaction as products minus reactants, just as we did for the other variables. Products minus the sum of reactants. There we are. OK, so the first way is to do products minus reactants. The second way is to calculate it in a Hess's law kind of a fashion like we did in the enthalpy chapter, we can find the total Gibbs free energy for the process as the sum of several steps. If we can break the overall reaction down into smaller individual steps, then we can add them together to get the total. Okay, no surprises there. And our third method, which is a unique one, is we can use reference tables to look up those standard values for enthalpy and for entropy and then we can use our favorite formula, Guppy's hate tartar sauce and we can solve and change in Gibbs free energy. So notice two of these methods, the first and the second, require having delta G values for something else, either the in individual component compounds or for sub-steps that happen along the way. Method three is the only one that doesn't require having another delta G value. It requires looking for these values. And watch out, because Many of these reference values are listed in the appendix 
on an exam. So if you get a question and there doesn't seem to be any information useful for solving a problem, you might want to look in the appendix on the formula sheet and look for some of these standard values and see if they might come in handy for solving the problem. So let's do an example problem doing just that sort of thing. So here is our example problem. Above what temperature does nitrogen monoxide form from dinitrogen and dioxygen, assuming that the values that we use do not change with temperature? So here's the reaction of, of interest. Nitrogen gas plus oxygen gas goes to, to nitrogen monoxide gas. So I've done you the favor of looking up the reference values for these numbers from the table. You can usually find these at the back of your textbook or at the back of any textbook or as part of your online homework system. So here's our standard delta H change values and our standard change in S variables. So let's dissect this problem and figure out what exactly we're trying to do here. So the first thing I see is I'm looking at the formation of NO. And that looks like the forward direction of this reaction that's indicated. So I'm looking at the forward reaction. The next thing I look at is, does this thing form? And does it form mean, does it happen without energy input at natural conditions? So it wants to know, when is it spontaneous? Is the forward reaction going to be spontaneous? And the last piece of information is above what temperature? So this is not something we're used to knowing. We're used to knowing the temperature at the beginning and solving for delta G to see if it's spontaneous. But we know things about delta G. We know things from the last video. We know that if delta G is negative, we have a spontaneous reaction. We know if delta G is positive, we have a non-spontaneous reaction. And we know that the, the boundary, the transition point between spontaneous and non-spontaneous is delta G equals zero. So what this question is really asking when it says above what temperature does this form is it's, it is saying at what temperature is the standard delta G equals zero? At what temperature does it switch from being non-spontaneous where it doesn't form to being spontaneous where it does form? Okay, so now that we've digested that question a little bit, let's move on, move forward. So we need to find the temperature for the standard change in Gibbs free energy equals zero. This is the tipping point between spontaneous conditions and non-spontaneous conditions. Oh, what a long word. There we are. Okay. So because I don't have any delta G values for anything, that means we'll need to solve using method number three from the previous page. So we'll need to find values to plug into this Guppy's hate tartar sauce formula. So you'll notice from my digging into the reference tables that we do have lots of values for delta H and delta S, but which one of these do we use? We have a whole bunch of them. So remember how we talked about how each state function, the total can be found with products minus reactants? Well, we are finally gonna get to put that into practice. So we are gonna need to solve for the total for delta H and delta S separately first, and then we can use our favorite formula. So products minus reactants is going to be two times our product, which is NO minus one times reactant and two, and minus one times the other reactant, O2. Products minus 
reactants. And so now we'll throw in our numbers. I like to just throw in the negative numbers first, just in case there's any negative numbers that I'm gonna be plugging in so I don't lose a negative in the process. So two times 90.3 kilojoules per mole. And keep an eye on those units, they like to change. One times zero and one times zero. Zeros are my favorite thing to find. And remember, we have zero for the enthalpy of formation of N2 and for O2 because these are pure elemental compounds in their standard state. So if we multiply that by two, we get 180.6 kilojoules per mole. Fabulous. We'll reward ourselves with a red underline. All right, so we've got this number, delta H. We're trying to find temperature. We know delta G naught, we're gonna set that equal to zero. So next we have to find a total delta S standard for the reaction. And it's gonna look like the same thing. It's gonna look like products minus reactants. We're just gonna use a different line from our table here. So we're gonna do two times 210.7 and watch out for those units, joules per mole Kelvin in this case, minus one times 191.5. Minus one times 205.0. There we are. Math happens here. You should end up with 24.9 joules per mole Kelvin. And just looking at my previous number with the red underlying and seeing that this one is in terms of kilojoules and this one is in terms of joules. I can already tell that it's going to be most helpful if we could have them in the same unit. So I'm just going to go ahead and convert this one to kilojoules while I'm here. Okay, so that's going to give me 1,000 times smaller, 0 0.0249 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. And that is my standard entropy change for the reaction. Voila. All right, there's our final number. So now we are ready to plug and chug into our favorite thermodynamic formula. We can play everybody's favorite game. Will Rachel fit all of this on one piece of paper? All right, so we said we're going to set delta G equal to zero to look for that tipping point where we go from spontaneous to non spontaneous. Our value for delta H standard is 180.6 kilojoules per mole. We are trying to solve for the temperature and our delta S value 0 0.0249 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. So if the units, those look good, this is gonna be kilojoules per mole. And if the temperature is in Kelvin, this whole term will be kilojoules per mole. So we're set, do a little rearranging, plug it into the calculator, and we end up with 7,253 Kelvin. And I think numbers make more sense in Celsius. So we'll go ahead and subtract 273.15 to get 6,980 degrees Celsius. And I dare say, that number is still really big, and it's so big that I'm not quite sure that I believe it. So I'm going to call bullshit, and I'm going to go back and check my math and make sure that these were in fact zeros, that I multiplied this correctly, I plugged in all the right numbers here, and yes, and I converted to kilojoules, and I end up with the same number. So that's still kind of confusing. I checked my math, and I still end up with this ridiculously high temperature. So let's go back and think about the reaction we're talking about. Nitrogen plus oxygen goes to NO. So if we have a really huge temperature, what does that mean? When we're less than that temperature, that means that this term is going to be small and delta G is going to be positive. 
So smaller than this temperature is going to be non-spontaneous. And if I am higher than this temperature, that means I'm going to have a large value over here, large negative value. It'll have spontaneous conditions. So this borderline tells me I have to get higher than 6,980 degrees Celsius to have a spontaneous reaction. So room temperature is about 300 Celsius. So it's way, way less than this. And that tells me I have to add a, an awful lot of heat to force this reaction to go. Could that be reasonable? Well, looking at the different compounds and thinking just about without even solving the problem, how I would predict this would happen, I would predict that this reaction would be non-spontaneous at normal room temperature. And that's because nitrogen, N2, is one of the most stable compounds that exists. And so I would expect it would take an awful lot of energy input to convince this compound to react to form NO. And so by that logic, it does seem reasonable that the amount of heat it takes to force this reaction to be spontaneous would be so incredibly large. So this is the end of the chapter on Gibbs free energy. Go forth and use your thermodynamic knowledge to predict about the energy of a reaction.